Hi, my name is Dr. Ali. Welcome to Foreign MD, where we share stories and experiences of foreign trained medical graduates who were able to navigate the rigorous transition process at every level. These stories are meant to inspire and encourage you. Stay tuned. Hello, welcome to another episode of Foreign MD. And I am very excited to have our current guest with us today. If you're joining us for the first time, this is Foreign MD. And what we do here is that we interview foreign medical graduates who were able to successfully transition to practice in a place different from where they trained. And so we share their stories and we'll just go to their journey with them. And so I have with me Dr. Oshobe today, and I'm excited to have her here as she shares her story with us. Thank you so much. She, uh, she's called Yo-Yo, so I'm just going to switch to Yo-Yo. Um, so, uh, yes. So, um, Dr. Oshobe, can you just introduce yourself to us? Well, thank you so much for um, inviting me on your program. I appreciate it. Um, so, like she said, I'm Dr. Oshobe. I'm originally from Nigeria. Um, in Nigeria, I obtained a BSc in human anatomy. And after doing that, I decided to go to Ukraine for medical school. And while I was there, I got my MD um, for six wonderful years. And then I came to the United States to pursue my dream of residency. When I came here, I decided to do a MBA with concentration in health services administration. Okay. So that's basically me in a synopsis. What made you make the decision to decide to come to the States? I mean, after training in Ukraine, I mean, you could have gone back to Nigeria to practice or practice in Ukraine. Like, why did you decide to come here? So, you know, when you're growing up, you read about different countries and um, you read about different lifestyles, different cultures. And I've always been someone who has been curious about different places. When I made the decision to go to medical school, I didn't think of the U.S. originally. I was actually thinking of the U.K. Okay. And then I visited and I, you know, it, it, it wasn't what I expected. Let me put it that way. Then I came to visit the U.S. and I met a bunch of doctors here as well. And I was like, you know what? I think the U.S. is the place for me. I think I am more extroverted. I like talking to people. Um, and so this, I just felt culturally this, suit, this was going to suit me. And on top of that, I had a lot of family here. So. It was an easy transition and easy decision to make. Okay, awesome. So we're done you with training over there in Ukraine, and then you come here. Like, what was that transition like? Prepare for your boards. Was it something that did you know already before you finished that you were going to come here, and did you start preparing for your boards right there, or how did that look like? So it was <laughs> very embarrassing, and someone who just jumps and does stuff. And without ever much preparation, I didn't even use to write books. I just read a few things and I wrote the exams. No shocking, you know, results. I failed. I failed really badly. And um, I went back to school. I told my sister, I'm done. The U.S. is overrated. And she's like, well, you've never failed at anything in your life before. So at least once you at least come and pass the exam, whether you use it or not, I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. And so when I graduated, I came back to the U.S., um, and I was on a visit visa at the time. And I prepared for my exams this time around. I, I met a colleague whom I knew from childhood. And we started preparing together. I'm not someone who likes who knows how to study for hours and hours. I would study four hours at a time max, even in med school, and it was enough because I tend to retain a lot. Yeah. And I remember coming four hours weren't cutting it. So that was one of the major challenges I faced. I'm used to, for instance, the way I we were trained in Ukraine was you had MCQs, you had theoretical questions, and you had vibers. Every yeah. test, every quiz, every exam. So what they would do is they'll take the best of three or they'll average all three. So it was easy for you to just move along. It was yeah. very individualized because I trust to see right away what your weaknesses were. Yeah. So when I came here and I was writing the US MLEs, the things that I personally observed were the questions were trick questions. You know, they were saying how fast you could read, how quickly you could pick out the little, you know, nuances in the questions. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't a test of your knowledge. It was a test of your English. It was a test of all kinds of craziness. Yeah. And so I realized very quickly that four hours wasn't going to cut it. And so that was the biggest challenge for me. It was getting into the, you know, mindset of studying for this exam, which is something I had never done before. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, wow. So how long did it take you to get your boards out of the way? Um, so I, I believe I started preparing because I graduated from med school in 2012. And I wrote my first exam after deciding to stay back. I wrote my first exam in April of 2013. And then I was preparing for the step two C K. Something happened personally that kind of set me back. And I had to leave the city I was in and move to another city and all kinds of things. I, I think to an extent I was a depressed. My friend would say I was very depressed. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I was having a lot of issues. But all in all, I think I started my first step in 20, 2013, April, and I finished my step three in August of 2014. So basically, I don't know how many months that's in between, maybe 16 months, 18 months. I'm not sure. Okay. You, you did it pretty quick, so that's good. You did awesome. I didn't now, have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was at that time doing a master's program right for my boards. It was just so much going on. I'm like, oh, I need wow. to get something up because of the pressure. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So what's your current specialty now? And was that your original choice? I'm one of those people who, when I was growing up, it was, it was it felt like an insult when they would tell me I was jack of all trades and master of none. And that's what it was. I liked psychiatry. I liked family medicine. I liked internal medicine. I liked OBGYN. And my letters of recommendation, you know, they all showed everything. I had a pediatric recommendation, OBGYN, you know, letter of recommendation. I had a family practice. But like the, my, my, my application was all over the place, I'm yeah. telling you. And so they asked me, what do you want to do? I'm like, oh, psych. And that's the one letter that I didn't have. So <laughs> I kind of stumbled into internal medicine, which is what I'm, I'm doing now. Um, I remember um, walking with a doctor who he was actually an OBGYN and we had a conversation and he says, you know, the way you sound, I think you like working with adults, you like talking to people, you build relationships very quickly. Um, you say you don't like seeing kids in pain, so pediatrics is out, so just throw that letter away. And so when we narrowed down, internal medicine was the thing that I loved. And I remember when I, you know, went back looking at that phrase of jack of all trades, master of none. Um, the full phrase actually says, jack of all trades, master of none, but better than master of one. one. So I, it, it, I gained confidence along the way, and then I, I put my hat in the ring for internal medicine, and, and I got it. Awesome. So when you finished, when you finished your exams, um, how was the application process for you? Was it just a one-time thing? You just put it in, and then everything just fell in place? Or what did that look like for you? That would be a fairy tale. <laughs> fairy tale in the Hallmark movie is you write your exams and you pass and you know you walk into the sunset with your MD degree and your lab code. That's that's not what happened. Okay. okay. So I finished my exams in 2014. I applied in 2014. And I applied to 300 programs that I hand selected and picked because I wasn't coming in with the best with the best profile, when I put it yeah. that way, my thoughts were into how I already had a failed attempt. I was yeah. needing a visa, so I needed to be broad. Yeah. And when I applied, I was just getting rejection after rejection. I didn't get a single interview to assess go around. Yeah. And I was really heartbroken because the people I had, you know, been preparing with all got interviews or matched. And so I going at it again the second time around, doing the same things, but this time I was a little more discreet. I was more picky. I chose the regions I wanted to live in that was close to family or friends. Um, I chose programs that were ING friendly, so to speak. I tried to streamline my application a little bit. I got more family and internal medicine um, letters of recommendation. Yeah. Um, and I tried to work on some of my deficiencies, such as by this time, I was almost what, two or three years out of medical school and so on and so forth. Yeah. And this time it was better. I did get one interview and that was at Bronx, Lebanon. It was in pediatrics. Okay. And uh, which I didn't really like. <laughs> I would pick anything. Yeah. Because I so much time and effort. Yeah. And I go over there and we have the interview and I didn't, I didn't match. Mm. So at this point, I'm trying to say, you know, it's been how many years? So this is 2012. I came in 2013, 2014, 2015. We're now going into 2016. Yeah. So I, something has to give. I can't keep doing this. And you know how you go on the boards and you keep reading about you need to make connections, you need to make interactions and everything. So I reached out broader than I've ever done. 
I talked to a friend who introduced me to an interview course on Facebook. He was a wonderful guy. He taught me some interview skills. He's like, yep. you know, your profile is not the best. If you get one interview, you have to nail it. You nail it. Know? Yeah. So he did a very good job teaching me how to speak, how to express myself, how to make eye contact, you know, things like that. I started working with a friend who was at the Texas Medical Center doing research. So, so she kind of showed me some research skills and things like that. She started introducing me to the research community. I just put myself out there. Yeah. 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 But it's coming my way, fortunately. And eventually I got a research position um, at Montefiore in New York. And that was the place where I did my research. And then I applied again. And this time I pure publications, all the contacts I had putting in a good word for me because now I had increased my circle. I was talking, yeah. talking to people like me who were interviewing. In my interview class where I was in interview training, I had over 30 people who were applying and they were all putting in words for me. The ones who had matched the previous yeah. year, they were putting in words for me. And I was hearing more about openings um, or places that were looking for people with a certain profile. And so when I applied in 2016, I matched for 2017, um, July. Internal medicine. So, awesome. Internal. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what you're finally, it's like all your dreams have come true, right? It's like, okay, finally you get this door open, like, and then you start residency. What, was it a smooth transition at that time? Like the things just fall in place, like you thought they were going to you know, you keep asking these fairy tale questions, and I'm like, no, no, that's not how real life works. Real life, before you put curveball after curveball after curveball. So, by the time I was going into residency, I had married and I had kids. I had twins. Okay. Oh wow. Right. Oh wow. They came at seven months, but I was very blessed. They never had any issues. They just right. had issues with growing. Um, and getting weight. So they went to yeah. the for six weeks. So by the time I was going into residency, I had my twins in March to went to Nikki for six weeks. I came home in May oh, and wow. I started residency at the end of June. Right. Um, if any of your followers or you yourself as a child, you'll realize very quickly that a baby requires a lot of stuff. I tried to deal with them in the same schedule. It wouldn't work. One will wake up at 11, the other one will wake up at 12, and they'll do that all morning, all, all night till morning. And then I would go into work without any sleep. Yeah. Bear in mind, I had been out of residency. I've been out of medical school for about three, four years at this point. Yeah. Yeah. So, so a, a lot of my medical knowledge was kind of old, outdated, yeah. was lost in the mesh of sleeplessness. Yeah. And then, on top of that, I never really practiced after I left medical school. So I didn't yeah. even have the clinical skills. To you, you're not thinking like a doctor yet. No, I was a mom. And there were days I would come out of, you know, work because of the lack of sleep and everything with my mommy brain, so to speak, and I forget where I parked my car. That was just my personal stuff. But then in residency, I was with people who were, you know, they were really sharp. Like they would ask them questions before the question comes out. They're responding. So it was a really, really uphill battle for me. Yeah. Um, and, and bear in mind that I schooled in Ukraine, which is considered a federal country. We didn't do a lot of stuff on the computers. I had to be typing here, which to be fair, I had worked at a call center one of my lifetimes. So yeah. I was okay with helping and stuff, but just organizing myself and my you know, my day was very getting difficult. used to the EMR. Was that challenging too? Getting used to the EMR, getting used to the hospital, getting used to the culture, getting used to the patients, getting used to everything. It was like I was a baby. I was basically learning everything all over again. It was a really, really bad challenge. And I had a lot of difficult times. Yeah. So how did you pull through? Well, I pulled through doing what I have always done my whole life when I face a crisis. First thing I do is I reach out to my support group. I'm from a very large family. I reached out to my siblings. I reached out to my good friends. I have friends from I have friends from kindergarten, believe it or not, that are still my friends till this day. I would reach out to them, those that were in medical in the medical field, those that were not. They would pray with me, pray for me, talk to me, listen to me. Um, I had people who were on the phone with me till I got to work, so I didn't fall asleep on the wheel. I ha- I had an army, and I remember when I graduated, one of the things I said was that if it takes a village to raise a child, then it's yeah. it's an army to train a resident. I had a wonderful oh, wow. army, and I still. Do. I still do. They're still, so 
the main thing is to surround yourself with a support system that's unrelenting and believe in you, even when you don't believe in yourself. Oh. And if you're a religious person, you cannot, you cannot under, underestimate the place of prayer. When I was in residency, it was a, it was a, it was a religious program. It was a Catholic program. And every morning after our morning report, I would go to the church and I would pray and God will direct my day. And he did. So those were the two things I would say, family, friends, God, that's it. That's all oh. that got me. Oh, wow. So even from, from what you're saying, I mean, cause you, I mean, here you are newly married, you have twin girls. I'm guessing your husband was pretty much a strong backbone because it sounds like, I mean, with residency, he was pretty much solo parenting by that time. <laughs> he was. And I'm not going to lie. He put his, you know, he's also a physician and he was in Nigeria all this time. I was trying to get in. He literally put his life on hold. And I remember when I had the kids in the hospital and I matched, I matched on the Tuesday, on a Monday. I can't remember what it was on the 15th. And I had my kids on the 17th of oh, wow. March. And I remember when the girls came out, he took one look at me and he said, I'm going to have to stop everything to take care of you guys. And oh, wow. But he, he put himself on the back burner for me, for the kids. He couldn't study at that point because there was just so much that we needed. Yeah. So he one of, he was my greatest friend and my greatest foe. You know how married <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, but he, I can't lie, he won't. Because he was with me every day. My family, my friends, they were call and all that stuff. But he was there. Limited. Like exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. With one baby, I kind of begin to imagine that then you only have two. Oh, wow. Wow. So I said, we, we, we thank God. So, but at what point in time did you start to feel like I can breathe? Like my head is above water. Was it during like the middle of residency? Like, or was it even after? So, I mean, the way my program is, the whole residency sits on the shoulders of the test years. You're there 24 hours. I would have only one weekend off a month. And when you get to your second year, you have like two and one and a half weekends kind of thing. Yeah. So you start feeling relief. But my third year, you're like, what can you guys do to me? <laughs> you know, my third year was when I started having the feeling of, okay, I'm done. And I was one of those people who was so done that I actually got my job a month into my third year. <laughs> I was my CV was prepared. I applied for the job. I interviewed. I remember going. I was an ICU resident, ICU and apprentice at the time. I walked through the night. I drove three hours for my interview, and I came back home. I sent me the contract. Boom! I signed it. Like I was <laughs> first month of my third year. I got my job, oh, and wow. at that point, no matter how stressful residency was, I would just you could just see a job. Check and you know, <laughs> so yeah, that year was when the stress let up and it showed in everything I did because I was more relaxed, I was more patient, I was more curious about the world, I was more curious about medicine. Yeah. I found my love for medicine again in 30 years. Oh, wow! So, looking back, would you say that you were well prepared for residency? No, no, not at all, because I had all this, you know. I had years where I had I had limited medical contact. I wasn't prepared because I couldn't prepare. I had all yes. these kids and you know all these things going on. I wasn't prepared. But the main thing about me is that I don't give up on stuff. You know, I feel there's nobody who was born knowing what to do. I feel no matter how prepared you are, even if you're an American graduate who studied here and schooled here, the learning curve. And because I've done a few jobs in my life, I know that there's always a plat you have to go from the bottom, hit a plateau, and then you you know you you hit gliding at altitude. Yeah. Um. So I I knew that there was going to be challenges. I just didn't expect it to be that difficult. So no, I wasn't prepared. But yes, I was willing to learn, and I learned. I learned from everybody: the nurses, the cleaners, every single person. I learned from. Mm -hmm. And um, I still use those skills till today. I still love the names of cleaners at my new job. I know. Talk to everybody. That's awesome. Like a friend of mine, she, I mean, she, she told me, she said, stuff is not congenital. No. <laughs> like nobody was born knowing these things. Like no. <laughs> that you, you learn it, you know, yeah. so there, there's always that learning curve, especially for IMGs, uh, like I said, coming from a developing country to a developed and then everything is different. 
the customs, the way you talk to patients, the way, I mean, every single thing. So some, it, yeah, it can sometimes be a steep learning curve. Awesome. Very so, <laughs> so looking back now at your journey and where you are now, um, your, how many years have you been, um, in practice now? So I graduated in the middle of COVID. So I graduated in 2020, so it's been three years. So one year I spent as a day shift hospitalist and the last couple of years I've been a nocturnist. Oh, wow. Okay. So would you look, looking back, would you say it was worth it? Like everything I went through, right where I am right now, I think it was worth it. So, I mean, I knew it was worth it even <laughs> while I was going through it. It's just, you know, you don't want to, it's like how everybody wants to win the lottery. You know, we don't ever buy the ticket. Yeah, but we always want to win hundred million dollars. That's on the, you know. Yeah. Um, it was worth it. It is worth it. And I think it will always be worth it. Even if I pivot out of medicine into something else, it's something that I really love. And I don't think when I was here or in Nigeria or in Ukraine, as long as I was I'm working as a physician, caring for patients, it's worth it. That's awesome. So what are the things you wish you had known before that you think may have just made the journey a little bit easier? Like someone's listening to you and be like, what? What do you think she wished she had, she had known before all this? Well, I wish I had done my research <laughs> and known that a failure would have been like when I failed my step one. I remember someone said, oh, you'll never work in the U.S. Even people with high scores don't work, you know. And I, I, I think that puts so much stress and pressure on me when I finally decided to go on the journey. Yeah. I wish I had done the research. I wish I had looked into the materials and looked at people's experiences, talked to people who had been through it. Yeah. To hear what their difficulties were. Yeah. Um, because I remember when I came in, after my failure, I talked to a senior colleague of mine, he's a radiologist now, and he says for his Indian, and he said, you know, it doesn't matter your scores, because you look like you're so worried about your scores and your steps. It doesn't matter. I have a group of friends, I scored the highest, they matched me. So if just don't sweat the small stuff. Enjoy the journey, study, do your best, and then leave the rest for you know, God or whatever. So I wish I had been kinder to myself. I yeah. wish I'd done my research. Yeah, yeah. And, and I hear that a lot. And like I said, I always encourage people. It's like, because I, I, I mean, if you talk to people, you would find out that what they say is not really what's on ground. You know, mm -hmm. I've seen people who've had two two attempts and then they matched. You know, they just mm -hmm. did not give up. Like they just mm -hmm. did not give up. They they knocked on as many doors as possible. And, and he kept knocking and someone said yes. You know, that someone looked past the scores and someone looked at the individual. You know, because a lot of people go through different phases in their life. I've seen people who I, you know, I know are brilliant. Like this is, there was no doubt about how brilliant they were, but they were going through something in their life during the time they were writing their boards and somehow they didn't, you know, they did not pass. You know, it wasn't a reflection of what they knew. It was just circumstance and life. You know, and finally, like I said, a program saw, you know, beyond that and saw the individual and they're able to get in. So awesome, awesome. So yeah. do you have, um, you've had quite an amazing journey and I'm so glad that you're able to share your experience um, uh, and you pushed you and you're resilient. So uh, the kids are a little bit grown now. So I'm yeah. guessing you have. <laughs> oh God, yes. Some free time to yourself. So. If there were any IMG that wants to take, what's the one tip you want to leave for them? Any IMG that's listening to you right now? So um, the one thing I think, besides having, a, you know, doing your best, and whatever that best comes out to be, it's getting to 50s or 205 or whatever, just do your best, best of all. The second thing is you have to get connections. You have to network. I think... IMGs, we say the words, but we don't really tell people how to network, how to connect. True. And the reason I'm talking about connections is because that's how almost every IMG gets a job. I'll tell you yeah. this. Every 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 residency program in the US has anywhere from a thousand to three thousand people applying. Yep. No program director is gonna reach your three thousand. You know. Okay, yeah. fine, maybe filter it down and get five hundred people. You know. But you really need to get someone who puts in a good word for you. And that someone could be anybody. It could be yes. a nurse on the program. It could be a chorus, you know, someone who was your friend, yeah. someone you didn't even know. Oh, well, you just know went to your school, you reach out to them, they're alumni, you say, please, can you put in a word for me? And they, you know, you need someone who speaks for you. Sure. And I, I say that particularly because I've taken my time to talk to a bunch of people and they always had someone who somehow bubbled the application to the, you know, to the surface of all that. 
I think we don't we, we do an injustice to ourselves when we don't acknowledge the place of people in our journey. Sure. And the, I'll give an example. I don't want to just talk in abstracts. I in that interview program that I was in, there was a girl who scored 210, 215. Like she was my scores. They were not they were like my scores. They were not sky high. She had 10 interviews. And there was another lady who scored about 250 and she had one interview somewhere in rural Texas. So I'm sitting here I'm like, this is not adding up. Now, the one who got the 210, she would she would talk to anybody, anywhere, about anything. She would drive to hospitals and just say, hi, my name this is me. Yeah. Like, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> she would. And she was from a university that had a lot of network and they actually had groups that would say, who is applying from our university this year? I'm going to try to yeah. push them you know, through. And so she was the one who made me realize that I could get the best score. I could be all these wonderful things. But if they never get to okay. see me, yeah, yeah, they would never ever no. give me the opportunity to even interview. That's okay. one thing. So getting someone who bubbles your name to the surface. The second reason why reference is important is when I was going for my interview, I was doing my research, and I remember my my and at the time my preceptor he wrote a letter. He said, "You must with you," and I said, "I can't. I'm 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 tired. I was pregnant at the time I was interviewing." He says. Stop being lazy. Go there, get that letter. I'm like, okay. So I finally got the letter and I didn't want to get the letter because you know how they say your letter has to be blinded. You can't read it. You can't see it. It doesn't carry as much weight. He yeah. said, take it. And I didn't want to take it because I'm like, you're not going to listen to anything in this letter. So I took the letter and I read it and I said, I called him on the phone. He was at the airport. And I said, is this, you really think this about me? He said, I think more. But I can't, that, those are the things I can put in two words. And I, I was so pregnant and crying in the middle of a street in New York. And when I got up to my interview, I interviewed the people who had better scores than me, had wonderful publications in all kinds of journals. I mean, these were people that I would never have sat with if someone had been put in a word for me, yeah. who had a program director call me in. And then there was this letter. When my program director read the letter, he says, is this you? I said, think so. <laughs> and he said, I don't believe it. And then we had the interview and he shook my hand. He says, it's just a really good interview. I'm going to call this man and I'm going to see if you wrote this letter yourself because it's too good to be true. And so he did call. Um, unfortunately, my boss was out of the country, like I told you. Yeah. But his boss was there and his boss basically echoed everything. So now I was getting a reference from two different people. And he basically echoed everything in that letter. And I remember when I got the job, I called him and I was crying on the phone and I said, I got the job, I got the job. So my point is, if you have one thing to take away today, get connected and get those references. Get the, all the difference, regardless of your scores. A lot of things make up who you are and people can see that in your application if you can only get to your hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I thank you. It's been an amazing time just hearing your journey, hearing your story. And I know that someone out there would definitely benefit from it. So if someone wants to reach out to you to ask you any questions, like are you connected? Are you on any LinkedIn or is there a way they can reach out to you to just ask questions or just um, seek help? Yes, I actually, I actually, well, personally, my interview people will reach out to me if they're willing. Um, I am on LinkedIn with my name at Busy or Shuli on um, Instagram, which is which is the best way to reach me. I'm <laughs> Plum Rain. Uh, but if you get to my LinkedIn, if you message me there, I can always direct you to the easiest way to reach out to me and, and go from there. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, appreciate your time. And um, those of you me. watching on Foreign MD, you can also join the conversation on our Facebook group. Um, and that way you can ask questions and we can give you the right connections. But um, I hope you benefited from her story. Um, I absolutely did. And I uh, appreciate your time. Dr. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please share, like, and subscribe to encourage a fellow physician who is also on this transition journey.